I will be discussing here today as part of my ongoing master's degree dissertation, and uh, I will be discussing Sao Paulo under an archaeological and under an, uh, the perspective of archaeological urbanism. And uh, I'm going to look into the Pinheiros II site, that is currently my, my main focus in, in uh, my master's degree, uh, to observe evidences of urban complexity among the, among the archaeological record. Uh, the Pinheiros II site is located in Sao Paulo, or the University of Paulo, and it's in the, and today is in a very highly dense urban area, as you can see. And it's close to the main river, one of the main rivers that cross through the city, the River Pinheiros, that takes after the name of the, the uh, of the site. Um, and this is uh, this is São Paulo today. I and mean, when people think of São Paulo, it's one of the largest cities in the world. And people think of buildings, concrete, glass. Uh, and uh, there is no doubt that today this this is a city. And uh, however, this wasn't always the case. It was a uh, it, uh, Sao Paulo took a lot of time in, uh, in develop, uh, developing its urbanity. Uh, as you can see here, this is the first map that Sao Paulo appeared. And it's appears right over there, <laughs> like a small, a small footnote. And this was 80 years after it was founded. Because the Portuguese arrived in the 1500s, and Sao Paulo was founded, its first settlement was founded in 1554. But only in 1631, this map appeared. And it's still, it's, you, can tell very little about it because this map is, is basically of the captaincy of São Vicente, that was the that was kind of the, the state at the time, and and it, during a lot of time map wise, São Paulo was representing it by this in this, in this form, small uh, footnote, uh, very sidelined in the in the in the colony. So, uh, as I told you, uh, through, so through historical and archaeological sources, I would contribute to the discussion regarding Sao Paulo under an archaeological perspective, could be considered a city before its official elevation to the status in 1711, because that's when the Portuguese, then the Portuguese decided they would finally call Sao Paulo a city. But maybe Sao Paulo was behaving, to, behaving as one before, that, before this period. So we made a use of an attribute table elaborated by Michael Smith uh, in 2016 and took under consideration also by Monica Smith, Colin Renfrew, and all these people that you can see here. <laughs> and, uh, and I would also verify if some of these aspects that were, that were brought to light could also be seen in the archaeological record in Pinheiros too, as we took into consideration all these, like population, area, palaces, architecture, craftsmanship, uh, Fortifications gate, you can see all there. <laughs> and uh, we were talking to see if we could see if they, were, if they could be quantified, <coughs> if, they, if they were presence or absent, uh, if they had a scale, if they, or if they could have a scale of intensity. And uh, after um, an extensive research through articles by, arch by archaeologists, architects, geologists, and a very interdisciplinary research, uh, we could verify 16 of the 16 of these of these attributes, uh, 16 of these 22 attributes, and uh, according to Smith, 12 would be sufficient to be considered a city. However, how many of those we can see we, we, we can see in the archaeological record in Pinheiros? Because as uh, uh, as Kino also mentioned, that they have this problem in Zojijek. Uh São Paulo also has this problem. The modern city uh, completely surpassed over the uh, over the colonial city. So. Uh, we don't have we don't have uh, so many we have so many evidence of this for, of this of the first colony. Um, the Pinheiros society was excavated in a context of preventive archaeology, as you can see, this is one of the images of the excavation. And inside the, in the in the site, we also managed to, we also managed to find nine pit kilns. Um, the, the, the pit kiln number two I represented here, and the three D the, the three D scan of the same pit kiln. Uh, of a total of nine, uh, a total of, fi of uh, over fifty-seven thousand artifacts were unearthed during these three years of excavation, among which forty thousand, about forty thousand, were of ceramic fragments, and uh, the remainder of the remainder of those of the of the other typologies were faience, glass, porcelain, as you can see here. But uh, the ceramic production was our main focus, since. There were nine pit kilns, and uh, they, it was a partly a pottery uh, pottery works. Uh, we told, we also took 
17 samples uh, to be dated to terminal innocence in the Pinedos. Most of them at the average dates ranged from uh, 50, 1546 to 1687. I also highlighted in blue the, the, the samples that were taken, they were taken from within the thick kilns. Uh, therefore, they, they have a better chance of, of indicating the, the, the period in which the pottery works were in operation. Um, here is another representation of the of the same of the same dates. Just to better point out the the, the, the concentration of dates between the 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, they were most of them. Um, to understand the to understand the pottery works, you also get to understand the production, and we got to we, we got to see the, uh, several of the pot, several of the vessels being the, being being done with uh, using several techniques, not only one. And uh, the molded, uh, most of them are, uh, had uh, presented a molded section in the, in the bottom half and the, uh, the, the top section being finished by modeling. And uh, this uh, sort of, this uh, kind of production using ser several, several techniques um, also relates to what Sinopoli calls, what Sinopoli calls a workshop industry. Uh, which, she, uh, which she defines as uh, an increase in scale of production, changes in ceramic technology, production using wheel or molding, introduction of kilns, standardized production, specialized craftsmen or craftswomen. And uh, so, uh, so we, could, we could observe a mercantile, a mercantile intent in what we found in Pinedos too. We also got to find some uh, some uh, fragments that were rushed and uh, had presented rudimentary and repetitive patterns, showing that uh, people kind of shown lack of care in, the, in in what they what they had in the final product. As you can see here, uh, in the first image, we can see some finger marks on the inside of the pot, so which was poorly poorly finished, and this happened quite uh, commonly. Uh, poorly finished appliques were also found. For example, this one they not even finished fully attaching it. And uh, large temper was also found in several, in several fragments. I'm not going to bore you with the statistics, but uh, if anyone wants to know statistics, please feel free to ask uh, <laughs> later. Uh, but who was making these pots? Uh, we managed to see several European, sh European, sh uh, European shapes. For example, this cake pan, this frying pan, and this jar, because the indigenous people that from Brazil did not produce these kinds of shapes. However, the uh, indigenous, uh, indigenous and African patterns could be observed in decoration, uh, since there were several incised patterns that relate to, the, uh, to, relate to these ethnicities. Some might say it's a mameluca production, that's the Brazilian term for, for the social mix between indigenous peoples and, uh, Europe and Europeans. Uh, as you can see here, uh, Simanske, one of the researchers in Brazil that leads with, that's uh, Leading expert in uh, African in, in African influences, um, uh, the note uh, showed that uh, the, the the diamond patterns that can be seen in Pinedos over here, they all they could be related to uh, to uh, to body scarifications and cer and ceramic decoration in the in Central Africa that can be seen here and here. Um, one of the other interesting aspects that that also related to African influence was this was this. This only shirt. It was, this, this was uh, this was a, a single child in Pinedos that uh, did, did this point out to a Bakongo cosmogram. This one is especially is especially quite interesting the story because the cross within the applied circle represents the daily journey of the sun around the world of the living and the world of the dead, and the water represented by the horizontal line uh, divides both worlds. The circle represents the idea that life is endless, a perpetual cycle. But this was the only one that, 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 could, that was directly related to it. But uh, it's also important to note that uh, almost 5 million uh, enslaved individuals were brought, from, uh, brought to, uh, to Brazil from Africa between, 50, between 15, 1539 and 1856. Therefore, it's expected to find uh, a lot of African influence in Brazilian material culture. However, it's not that common to be found in Sao Paulo. Because Sao Paulo took uh, some more time to receive uh, uh, enslaved individuals from Africa, we had a predominance of, uh, in, of indigenous labor in in Sao Paulo. Even though there are records of African individuals by 1612, uh, 1620, so it's more common to be so it's more common to associate these 
these uh, diamond patterns to what can be to what can be produced by the Guarani and the Tupi in the in the, also in the region. As you can see, they also produce uh, similar uh, they also produce similar uh, in size patterns. Uh, the, 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 the presence of uh, red angle in, in the ceramic also relates to this, indigenous, to this indigenous influence, because it was extremely common among the Guarani to use, the, to, to use this red paint inside the vessels. And this appears to be in a, it appeared in several shirts in Pinedo's tool as well. Uh, this just a small this is just a, a small demonstration of how many ethnicities and languages could be found in Brazil during the during the during the, during the colonies. There are over 900 references to various ethnicities and languages, and this this map is actually from only from from 1981. So there's probably more. <laughs> there's probably more, and it also shows several of the several of the migration patterns that occurred. So. Uh, this is just sh to show how many, how much of, uh, of uh, indigenous culture uh, the, the Portuguese encountered when they arrived, and how much of their culture can be intertwined with the colonial experience in Brazil. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, what, we, what we got so far from this from, from this project is that the is to represent an array of in, uh, an array of influences, and this variety of influences. Uh, Represents much of what São Paulo, of what of what uh, of what São Paulo's identity was, and it is especially with especially with, and with the identity related to the to the mameluco. Um, the, the production was standardized related to mercantile production and economic goals, and the dates we pointed we pointed out that we pointed out earlier during our during our attribute table, uh, they coincide with the dates obtained with with, with the terminal minimum datings. Therefore, the, the, therefore, uh, therefore, the Pinheiros too uh, uh, is, uh, is part of uh, is part of this uh, this process of urbanization in São Paulo. We also we also we were able to conclude that through what we saw in, this, in the ceramic production that five of the attributes established earlier to identify urbanism could be found in Pinheiros, such as craftsmanship, markets and stores. Uh, social diversity, identity, and uh, imports with faience, glass, and uh, porcelain, and um, and it's much more. Uh, references, references, uh, uh, just a few acknowledgments to my scientific advisor who helped me uh, helped me in the project, to Paulo Zanetti that also helped in the conception, the people in the those people in Brazil that had patience with me analyzing my materials, the Museum of Archaeology and Capes, and especially to the EAA uh, that they Actually, they provided me with the Dios Carmen Celius grant, so this was it was, it was a paramount importance for me to be here, and to all of you, uh, thank you very much. <laughs>